Susan Deal to you. Uh, Susan is the Minister of Music at College Park Baptist Church in Orlando, Florida. She's originally from Alabama, which is a wonderful thing. And um, she still likes Alabama football. I read on the website. Uh, Susan is married to Tommy Deal, and they have two sons, uh, Reagan and William. Uh, Reagan was a church music major at Stanford, and William was a religion major, and both of them are at the School of Theology now. Uh, Susan is a graduate of Stanford and is a graduate of Southwestern Seminary. I actually was telling Susan a while back that I got to know her uh, vicariously through her master's thesis. Um, when I was a student at Southwestern, she was just a year ahead of me or something like that and got asked to tap before I did. And I remember looking at her thesis a number of times as kind of a model for my thesis. So I knew her name and knew her work long before I actually knew Susan. But it's um, great to have her here, and we're um, really blessed to have her presence this afternoon. So, Susan, thank you for being here, and we look forward to hearing you well. It is good to have an opportunity to, to be with you and share with you this afternoon. I've been excited about coming back to Texas. This was, for five years, a very special place in Fort Worth, but um, it, it was a very special place for me. It was where I met my husband, uh, where I began my ministry um, of, of music and uh, other um, ministries among the good people of Rosen Heights Baptist Church in Fort Worth. Um, I had an opportunity to have breakfast with Emily and Ann and Stephanie uh, this morning and got an opportunity to sort of get a little bit of a feel for uh, where you are and, and what you are doing as church uh, music undergraduate and graduate students. And I look forward to perhaps after this class time have an opportunity to talk with you. Uh, what we're going to do today is... Um, and first of all, we're going to do sort of an annotated worship service. This is a worship service that we did in August, and I brought with you what you have in your hands. Uh, the blue sheet is not the, our uh, order of worship, not our, our bulletin, but this is, and, um, where's Anne? Oh, she's talking to me. The, uh, I, I just described that I do some color coding that helps us in our preparation. You don't see that, but there are some descriptions of, uh, this is what goes to our, um, uh, my ministry assistant and those who put this information into the bulletin. It's also instructions for the accompanist, what the hymn tune would be, or, or that sort of thing. We're going to walk through uh, this service. We'll skip over some things, but there will be an annotation of sorts. I will sort of give you a... a step aside from the worship and explain why or how we did some of these things. But I need you to help me with this. You should have in your hands um, the hymns that were noted and uh, the two anthems. And we will um, sing those as they come uh, in the service. Um, this uh, service was the first time that I um, preached a sermon, August 16th. Um, I, I had been on sabbatical in the first part of the summer, and actually I came to uh, Waco, and I'll share some of that with you. But um, we needed an opportunity for me to be accountable to my congregation for the six weeks gift that they gave me. I needed to sort of report to them about what I had discovered. And in the process, this sermon is also basically touches my philosophy of worship. So I thought that would be also an opportunity to share with you. Uh, where uh, I come from. I was uh, backing up. I was minister of music at Mount Hermon Baptist Church in Danville, Virginia for 11 years before coming to Orlando. I've been uh, at College Park for eight years. So uh, I had been in uh, at minister of music for 19 years. Prior to that, I was pianist, organist, children's choir director, whatever was needed uh, at the time. Uh, so, this is an evolution of my uh, philosophy of worship that I'll also be sharing uh, with you. The, um, I, we replaced the pulpit with a dinner table, and I asked someone in my choir to sit uh, with uh, full place settings. Uh, also had a centerpiece. The centerpiece, and you'll understand later, had, was um, a bowl of avocados and wine. 
And then also on the table uh, was a, a pitcher and a loaf of bread. This was also Communion Sunday. So imagine that uh, table set, and now let's begin worship. After we, excuse me, after we finish this time of worship, then we'll also talk about how we came to this as far as the collaborative worship planning process as there's time. So let's begin. I recruited some uh, folks to help me with the call to worship. This was an intergenerational call to worship. I had a senior adult and a child read uh, selected verses from Psalm 145, and Rick and Stephanie are going to pray. I will praise you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. I will bless you every day, and I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. His greatness is beyond discovery. Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy of your righteousness. They will talk together about the glory of your kingdom. They will celebrate examples of your power. All eyes look to you for help. You give them their food as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of everything you think. I will praise the Lord. And everyone on earth will bless his holy name. Forever. And forever. Our worship team then sang Lord Most High. We had a trumpet transition from that contemporary song into uh, uh, majesty.
Sean King would lead in a pastoral prayer. Following that, there's a litany uh, entitled Worship. It's from Prayers and Litanies for the Christian Season, written by Charlene Smith, who is uh, associate pastor at Lakeshore Baptist Church here in Waco. I love her book. If you have not seen that, I've got a uh, copy of that you, I'd love for you to take a look at. It, it really gives some wonderful voice to our thoughts and our prayers. Wonderful, wonderful writer. So we'll share together. I'll read the light print, you read the dark. Then Moses gathered the whole community and said, Bring your offering to the Lord. And the people's hearts were stirred, and their spirits were moved. They looked for gifts to bring. And they brought all kinds of gold jewelry, pins, earrings, rings, and necklaces. They brought wool and linen, blue, purple, and scarlet.
summer. So this is my uh, report from uh, sabbatical, my philosophy of worship, and my heart for what we should be doing. In Colossians 3, verses 12 through 17, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks to God the Father through him. And then in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Shall we pray? Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this, your word, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. You know what? I really like guacamole. The other day, I went with friends to a New Mexican restaurant. It was called Cantina Laredo. The restaurant's calling card is that they make fresh guacamole right at your table. We actually chose this restaurant for this feature alone. I concurred with the decision not because I particularly like guacamole, but because I love my friends and they love guacamole. First, the server sliced and squeezed a lime in the bowl to which she added secret spices. We guessed garlic powder was the main ingredient. Then she scooped out the tender meat from three fresh avocado halves. With two forks, she mashed the avocados until they formed a delicate, lumpy consistency, to which she added diced jalapenos, onions, tomatoes, and cilantro. Then she gently folded the ingredients together before placing the delicious-looking creation in front of us, next to a basket of light and crispy tortilla chips. Let me pause here to confess to you, I really don't like guacamole. First of all, it's green. And an interesting shade of green at that. It looks like lumpy mashed potatoes that were mixed with spinach or Alabama collards or something. <laughs> and it's made from an ugly looking fruit, dark green and pimply. It appears to have a texture that I wouldn't care to explore in my mouth. You know what? I've never really wanted to taste guacamole simply because I don't like what it looks like. And when I have accidentally eaten it, because it got too close to something I really liked, it actually didn't have much flavor. So, when given the opportunity to opt out of guacamole, I generally take it. Even though I have heard so many people tell me how much they love guacamole. So, imagine my surprise when I took a lightly salted, crisp tortilla chip, dipped it into that green stuff, and then hesitantly took a small bite. I think I said to myself, hmm, this is not so bad. In fact, it's pretty good. Actually, I kind of like it. I may even order it next time. The guacamole was a perfect appetizer for the main entree, which was brought to our table and served with other side dishes that also complemented the entree. Now, allow me to offer a parallel to our worship. While we all enjoy a variety of worship expressions, the key is a balanced plate. 
with each element pointing toward the entree, the Word of God. Today, I'd like to share with you examples of the variety of worship expressions I experienced this summer while on sabbatical. For those of you who may not know, College Park Baptist graciously provided me with six weeks of Sabbath rest this summer, which was divided between Birmingham, Alabama, and parts of Texas. While on sabbatical, I intentionally explored the why and how of worship, reading books on worship, attending worship services of differing traditions, and having stimulating conversations with professors and colleagues. I also had many opportunities to taste new things, particularly different ways of worship. While each time of worship was unique, there was a common ingredient found in each one. Just as the server who made our guacamole was meticulous in its preparation, the worship leaders were careful in their preparation. The times of worship were not haphazard or thrown together. They were well planned and executed with the word at the center of worship. The first Sunday of my sabbatical, Tommy and I, my husband, Tommy and I worshiped at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Birmingham. It was Trinity Sunday. I have worshipped at an Episcopal church only once before, so I was not very familiar with their rituals. St. Luke's gave very clear guides in the form of bulletins and visitor's brochures. In fact, most of my questions were answered in the visitor's guide. I read, it doesn't take long to discover that St. Luke's is a warm and welcoming church, but you might also notice that worshippers are encouraged to enter the church in silence and pray before worship. This is not to avoid visiting or fellowship. In fact, I heard energetic, friendly greetings exchanged in the foyer. But rather, our recognition that we are guests in God's house. This is an excellent time to be still before the Lord and be blessed by His presence. As I was being still, I noticed a young couple enter and sit toward the front. Tommy and I sat in the back portion of the middle section. Since I don't get to do that often, I wanted to position myself to participate fully, surrounded by other worshipers. As the couple moved into the pew, the man folded the kneeling bench down and knelt to pray. I was inspired by his intentional preparation for worship. Worship began with a procession of the cross held high by an acolyte, followed by the rectors and deacons and other worship leaders. The choir also followed, which circled back down the outer aisles and into the balcony where the organist was at the console of a beautiful pipe organ. We were in a cathedral-like room with high ceilings, flying buttresses, a slate floor, and wooden pews. The music enveloped the room as I joined the congregation <coughs> singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Sunday morning, however, we all went to Baptist Church of the Covenant. 
By the way, I found out later on that because we were four strange women sitting together, they first thought we were a pastor search committee. In spite of that, we were warmly welcomed into worship. And Usher guided us to our pew. As we sat down, I detected the distinct odor of mothballs from behind me. That smell triggered an olfactory memory from years ago. I didn't turn around, but I imagined that I was sitting in front of my grandmother. As worship began, the congregation ran a litany. I quickly discovered that the grandmother behind me was actually a mentally challenged person. For when we got to the time for the people to read, she enthusiastically read along. However, you could tell she couldn't read. But she was participating. She also sang the hymns robustly, sometimes in her head voice, and then quickly dropping down into her lower register. At the conclusion of the scripture reading, Sarah Shelton said, this is the word of God for the people of God. And this dear one behind me responded heartily with, thanks be to God. You can surmise that this time of worship was for everyone. And everyone joined in with great enthusiasm. Sarah Shelton, by the way, is the pastor of Baptist Church of the Covenant. She's an engaging speaker who connects with the people. There's a warmth and openness about her that readily flows from Sarah to her congregation and then from the congregation to one another. That day, Pastor Shelton's sermon was entitled, Anointed in the Presence of Brothers and Sisters, based on the story of David's anointing as king. As part of the sermon, using David's anointing for service as an example, Baptist Church of the Covenant commissioned eight youth participating in passport camp at Macon the next week. Each student chose a person who had an impact on his or her life to anoint them. Two of the students chose Miss Louise, an elderly woman that you could tell was loved dearly by the entire congregation. I didn't know it at the time, but I found out later that Miss Louise is 102 years old. Because of her advanced age, Miss Louise needed assistance so another woman that I also discovered later picks Miss Louise up and, as we say in Alabama, brings her to church each week. She helped Miss Louise dip her finger in the container of oil and rub each of the foreheads of the two students. It painted a beautiful picture of intergenerational ministry and worship. We need each other. Our children need the influence and wisdom of their parents and our grandparents or their surrogate grandparents. And our adults need the enthusiasm and vitality that our children and youth provide. Oh, announcements were made at the conclusion of worship. One of those announcements was about a potluck supper. As soon as the announcement was made, my mothball perfumed friend sitting behind me said, potluck supper, I'll be there. Also worship at Lakeshore Baptist here in uh, Waco. Doris Ann Cooper is the pastor there, and Charlotte Sledge is the associate pastor. Um, that morning was an unusual morning. It was different than their normal service. They had an ordination service for uh, the minister of youth who had just got his Master of Divinity from Truett. Do y'all know who that is? Charles. Charles. Yeah, I couldn't remember his name. Uh, this was a serendipitous opportunity for me to reaffirm my call and remember the time not so long ago that College Park Baptist Church ordained me. Lakeshore has a woman pastor, I believe, that Doris Ann Cooper has led her congregation to be a people at work in their community. They truly live out the principles of Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. They're celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, and they have 50, it's called Mission 50, a celebration of Lakeshore's 50 years on mission with Christ and each other. It's a lot of different mission projects that the church signs up to participate in all over Waco. And one of the statements in their uh, brochure is that it reflects worship that moves us into action on behalf of God's children everywhere. I believe that we can't just come in to worship 
and sing the hymns and sing the songs and hear the preaching and leave unmoved to make a difference. What we do as worship leaders, as the crafters of worship, is vitally important in the difference we make in the lives of our uh, congregation that we don't just walk in there and uh, have one hour of feel-good time, all about me and God, and not be changed to move into our world and make a difference. While in Texas, I also attended the Ritter Barry Conference on Spiritual Renewal. The first night of the conference, we were welcomed by a cowboy band that sang for us as we entered the San Antonio Municipal Auditorium. Once inside, before the first session began, we were serenaded by a roaming mariachi band singing One Day at a Time, Sweet Jesus, in Spanish. We worshiped in a variety of ways throughout the conference time. Contemporary worship, an Anglican worship service, and for our morning prayers, we experienced a contemplative today service. We experienced drama and dance, a cappella singing and contemporary praise bands, piano and violin, clarinet, oboe, and flute. There were prayers lifted up for us, and there were silent prayers, as well as prayers we read together in unison. Central to each time of worship was the Word, open to us through rich messages from Eugene Pearson, John Ortberg, Max Lakea, Richard Foster, and many others. We also had workshop tracks that gave us an opportunity to more deeply explore a particular area that could aid in our pursuit of spiritual renewal. I chose to attend the Creative Expressions workshop. Each session focused on a particular art form as an expression of worship, poetry, music, art, and movement. In the movement session, we were encouraged to move and dance our praise before God just as Miriam danced in thanksgiving to God for the Hebrews' escape from Egyptian bondage. As I self-consciously moved in my space, my attention was drawn to a young girl, a 12 or 13-year-old daughter, of the facilitator of the music session the day before. This precious young girl sang and danced with abandon, her face lifted toward heaven as she worshiped God. I stood in the corner and wept at the innocence and beauty of this praise offering. Now, I'm probably not going to dance with abandon in this place, but we have witnessed our young daughters use this gift as an expression of praise to God. We have an interpretive movement in our church. So in conclusion, we at College Park Baptist Church are a richly diverse congregation. We are, all of us, uniquely us, with a variety of gifts and speaking abundantly varied worship languages. For most of us, English is our native language. But we also have people in our congregation who speak Spanish, Portuguese, Yoruba, Chinese, and yes, some of us even do that with an Alabama drawl. We proclaim the word through preaching, music, drama, dance, visual arts, and media. We sing hymns, gospel songs, contemporary praise and worship music, classical music, spirituals, and global music. We have skilled musicians who play organ and piano, handbells, guitar, woodwinds, brass, and percussion instruments. Children, youth, and adults sing, read scripture, and pray. All ages participate. Men and women lead, serve, and preach. God has truly blessed us, and to whom much is given, much is required. We have the unique privilege and extraordinary responsibility to offer our gifts, all of them, in the service and worship of God. In this uh, service, we also had communion, and there was uh, offered an invitation to the table. We were transitioning from the dinner table that was set uh, as part of the, the, the pulpit <laughs> into communion. Um, there is a common thread among each church I visited this summer. They truly loved each other, and they demonstrated that love to me and outside of it. They welcomed me into their church as one would welcome someone into their home to share a meal around their table. 
As we have gathered in worship today, we continue in the table tradition, recognizing our need for nourishment and giving thanks to God's, for God's good gifts. By intentionally gathering as a community, we are fed and energized to do the work of Jesus in our world. Much of Jesus' ministry, both before and after his resurrection, took place at the table with his disciples, religious leaders, and many others. Most striking is how wildly inclusive he was in the companions he chose. When Jesus ate and drank with sinners, he did so with clear intent to extend love to outsiders. When he fed the hungry, he demonstrated the very present goodness and justice of the reign of God. Jesus' table practices were inseparably linked with his mission to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight for the blind. The early church continued Jesus' table practices in their community gatherings, frequently breaking bread together, welcoming outsiders who, who were drawn to the goodness of life in Christ. And as they participated around the Lord's table, they remembered Jesus' death and celebrated his living presence made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The choir sang uh, at, the, uh, at the table of the Lord. We're going to sing that in just a moment. But as the choir, in this particular service, as the choir sang, our senior adult man and our fifth grade uh, girl who read the uh, call to worship, Psalm 145, came uh, holding hands up to the table that was set, and they took uh, the pitcher, and they took the loaf of bread, and they together walked it down to the communion table, which was on the floor in front, and placed that. The transition from, the, 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 the idea was that the transition from uh, this time of worship segue immediately into the communion, but that the table is for all. Who, who accept Christ in their, in their hearts and in their lives and profess Him as Lord. So as we sing, imagine the senior adult and the child moving those elements down the community.
Greg Galloway, a man in our church, play guitar and sang the Heart of Worship. And Susan, uh, Mike's our pianist, played here in the cup, when in our music, God is glorified. We offered the invitation and we sang. And I'd like for you to sing with us the stanzas one, two, and five.
Sean comes into College Park Methodist Church. I have 18, 19 years of experience of doing it one way. And I realized, whoops, one of us, we've got to figure this out. So we knew before, actually before he came that this was uh, our pattern. We were actually excited about the possibility that we both were passionate about creating uh, worship expressions for all. But the collaborative worship planning process can be tedious at best. Uh, and we spent six or eight months learning a new dance. Uh, in that process, we and we're still in we're still learning, but in that process, if you take these and just share these, um, start to back. Uh, I'm a color coder, a chart maker, a planner, and so I had to have something to, to work uh, from which to work. Um, and so what you'll have is all the you might think it's not throughout pages, but there's one where it has uh, August, all the August Sundays, the text, what music might happen, and then other elements. If you'll look at August 16th, this is the one that we just that we just did. If you'll turn it over, you'll see our worksheet that we worked on. Um, my uh, outlines were not nearly as detailed as what Sean is. In fact, I have another one I can give you on the way out. But these were my thoughts and in preparing the sermon, and those things were jotted down as an extra things. And then we talked about what kinds of elements, either choir, ensemble, solo, instrumentalist, hymns, choruses, litany, drama, video, atmospherics, <coughs> for lack of a better word, you can give you that one out, and then what other elements might need to be added or, or included in that service. And so we just we just scratch all of this information together. We the the pastor Sean King and our minister to students Lucas Dorian and I uh, do this worship planning together. And so some of these things we use, some didn't uh, get there. But this is where the creative process happens. Now uh, it has evolved to the point where we do this, and then I take all of these ideas and make them fit into a um, some sort of pattern. Then we come back and look at it together and see how it flows and how it works, um, how, how these things work together. Um, this is just the beginning. It's going to be a, an evolutionary process for us as we um, continue to plan worship together. Uh, Sean is a wonderfully creative um, person and it's a wonderful opportunity to work with him. But I don't know, as you're preparing it, or if you are in a church and doing and responsible for the worship planning, that um, piece, it just depends on what pastor you work with as to what, um, what you have to work with and how you craft worship. I was, I was exceptionally blessed that I had those many years of someone that, a pastor that planned before Wednesday. Uh, I know that those, so many times, that's the, the types of, and God can, the Spirit can move in both uh, ways, but I do think the Holy Spirit can work through planning <laughs> as well. So, uh, that's essentially uh, what I had to share with you. However, I'm, I'm thinking as I had breakfast with Emily and Stephanie and Anne, there were some other questions that arose. I think Stephanie wanted to know, what do I do in a week? <laughs> Uh, and how does my schedule work? I'll be happy to share that with you, Stephanie, unless others uh, would like to know. But do you have any questions as we conclude? We've got a couple minutes. Okay. It has been my pleasure to be with you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. King. Yes? Well, I just have a question about the Song of Gathering. Yes. Um, in the church where I'm serving now, we sing in greet each other at the same time, and that's the way they've always done it, and it seems really awkward to me to be expected to sing a congregational song and greet the people around you. How do people respond to that? What, what we actually do is the choir sings at one time, and then I rally the troops, and we and, and that is the opportunity to, to pull that. That's not particularly my favorite thing uh, in, in worship, and I inherited that at College Park, and that's an interesting thing. College Park Baptist Church is 
They love to laugh, and they love to be together. And that is a part of, that's a part of their worship, that's a part of their, that, that community, it defines who they are. So I had to find a way to make that work. So what I did is, is either we had just instrumental, or sometimes the choir will sing, and then uh, we repeat it. So we sing it a second time, and that's when I draw and invite others to the rest of the congregation to join me. If you were to give us uh, two or three kinds of um, words of wisdom for young ministers of music from your um, years of experience, what would be two or three kernels that you would say, do this, this is important, this is absolutely life-giving, this is um, something you can't afford to not have, or whatever. What would you say? First of all, um, we all have an ideal of what we think uh, our ministry should be and uh, of what worship should be and that sort of thing. I, the one very important thing for me is to know your congregation. Know the people. Uh, and if, if there is a place where you would like for them to be musically or spiritually, you still have to start where they are. And there's a, there's a trust factor that you have to build. If you walk in and try to move them too quickly, uh, in, any, in any direction, they're going to put on the brakes and, and push back, and then you've lost the opportunity uh, that you've had. So know your congregation uh, and take time to get to know them as you move into that first, um, the, those, those first few months are critical. And I have, would tend to, in the, in the two churches that I've served, I would go in and, and work within their structure for a while, and then gradually add elements or gain their trust so that uh, those things can happen. And you can't you can't guide people who don't trust you. And so you have to establish that. Um, another that I am still uh, learning is uh, the benefit of Sabbath. Um, we can get into uh, producing and ministering to our congregation and forget that God works best through us when we are whole. And if um, we have run ourselves and burned the candle at both ends, uh, we are not giving God our best. So be sure to find time for, for Sabbath. And that's still a lesson that um, being for one who tends to like to check things off my list and produce, uh, pausing to rest and reflect and to, and to feed on God's word yourself. You can't ask others to, to join you if you're not nourished. Yes? I really do enjoy the, um, the sort of put together worship service that um, uh, shows rigorous coordination and careful planning. Um, but in, in a lot of country church settings, that can come across very stilted. Mm -hmm. um, and serving at uh, one of my churches for a year has really uh, brought this uh, uh, worship service into drastic relief because uh, before I went out there, I had an ideal that was similar to what we experienced today. But t today, I, I don't think I felt that it was stilted, but it, it felt very foreign. And um, I was just wondering about, uh, for instance, uh, I noticed a lot of the melodies uh, derived from sort of the um, sort of early American folk tradition, um, but I was I was just wondering um, what um, what are some ways that if if you were to uh, I mean transplanting is never really a good idea but to adapt something like this to a, a a smaller country church just to inject a little more of that good old Baptist spontaneity in there um, to make it a little more trustworthy to them. And, and uh, at my church at Mount Herman uh, Baptist in Danville, it was a rural community, and we did uh, because of knowing them. And that's that's the thing. College Park is a different different church, and that you're you're inheriting or you get to experience that. But at uh, Mount Herman, yeah, we did more. Uh, I, I used more gospel hymns, uh, and then interjected some uh, of, of these types and higher church hymns as well. Again, that goes back to knowing your congregation. You can't, I wouldn't walk in and do this service 
Oh, of course not. At, at, at the, but, but that is, that is and so I would do it in small bites uh, and, and, and add perhaps instrumentally. Always, when I introduce a new hymn, I'll start several weeks prior and have that tune, have the melody uh, okay. played with uh, as an offertory or as a prelude or something like that so that we begin to um, get that tune into their heads. And then perhaps have one, someone actually sing it uh, as a solo or um, an ensemble and then the congregation. So it's, it's, a, it's a slow process, but yes, that's, uh, that's what I would do. Susan, could you close by telling us just briefly what it's like to be a, a mother, um, wife, a minister, and how you have kind of lived those worlds and balanced that with children and family? Mine are, uh, my two sons are, are now at, at seminary, so we, we don't have children at home, and so my life is different now than it was when I had small children. When I began... Um, at, at Mount Hermon, when I began my ministry, I was part time, and uh, because I wanted to be, uh, I, will, I thought parenting was also the most important role that I could have at that uh, that period of, in my life. Uh, when the church asked me to go full time, uh, I also requested that um, I uh, do however many hours it would be in order to be home with my children when they got home from school. Uh, that was important. Have, my husband is a minister as well, and so we um, were very interested in um, raising children to love God and not hate the church by the time they got away because, because that's all they need. And so, um, and that could be, that could compete with times with parents. So that's an important thing, to balance and, and be, with, be with your family. I chose not to participate in some uh, professional organizations early on because uh, I only had so much time. Uh, so uh, balance, uh, you don't have to do it all at one time. Now I'm able to do more things because of Thank you. Thank you so much.